were there ever plans to put Shepard and Taylor together, even briefly in a romantic storyline, or mm-hmm. that wouldn't have worked uh, with her on his team? We see allusions to this in like the, yeah. the dream sequence in the. You know, it's, it's one of those instances. The shippers versus non-shippers uh-huh. uh, was was something that uh, you know uh, existed on SG One and uh, existed on Atlantis, and it's something we did toy with. Uh, and then uh, Rachel got pregnant, right? And we were like, "Ah, oh, what is can it? We shepherds? Do it? And, is it? Well, there was, there was there was one yeah, for like a half second. We thought consideration shepherds, baby. Yeah. And then I think I remember it was Paul who was like, "There's no way it can be shepherds, baby." Why so not? Uh, just from an honor um, perspective, you know, from I guess him as a team so. Member? From an honor, yes, yes. Okay. I think that was that was the uh, that was the issue. And so by not making it Shepard's uh, child, we that pretty much killed the the potential kind of relationship between uh, between the two of them. I just wish that there would had had been some kind of way to get more mileage out of the Taylor Kanan relationship. We see him for one mm-hmm. scene, you know, after yeah. he's restored, and I just yeah. wish that there had been you know a way to get more more out of that in terms of the story. But again, it's the stories that you want to tell and what's available. Yeah, you know, it's always the case. Sometimes, like you have a friend. Uh, and they end up getting together or marrying someone, and you're always like, "Man, they can do so much better. What is going on? What? 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 And what? I hear what that. do they? What do they don't know? And and Kanan was like a perfectly nice guy, I'm sure. And right. you know, I'm That's sure the- there was there was a side of him that we never got to know. But you know, on kind of the surface, you think Taylor could have done kind of <laughs> in hindsight. Would you have hooked Shepard up with someone by before it was all said and done, or do you think he's more of a lone wolf? It was Shepard's greatest wish, uh, uh, Joe Flanagan's greatest wish to be able to do uh, a little more Kirking, okay. uh, shall we say. <laughs> he did then, have uh, plenty of Kirking. Uh, yeah, well, not enough. <laughs> you don't think so? Not enough. No, no, no. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he. I, I remember he did pitch sort of maybe bringing on another character as a kind of a supporting character. Um, and the Jewel Wagner character from Travelers mm-hmm. was, uh, yeah, was initially introduced to sort of um, potentially fill that role. And but I mean, it was just one episode, and then she went off and got wiped out. And yeah, she was she unavailable. Back. Yeah, yeah, that's a shame. I think that there could have been something there. You know, mm-hmm. he's he's uh, Shepard is such a guarded character, um, and you know, there's there's a part of him that's still, I think, in Antarctica you know, basically scrubbing toilets, as it were, you know, after what he mm-hmm. did in Afghanistan. And I think a, a domestic kind of shepherd would have been interesting to see in terms of how it would have changed any of his characterization when he was on the battlefield. Something, yeah. I always yeah. felt that he had something to fight for back in Atlantis, but I'm talking like something to fight for, like someone mm-hmm. to fight for would have been interesting. Yeah, I agree. What was uh, Spina Breaker, the greatest challenge from the Wraith point of view in writing them? Was it the hive mentality? Was it getting inside their heads? The novelists had had an interesting uh, approach to this as well when they were writing the Wraith, because they had to actually label them. It was the only way to actually make the novels work. No, I, I think yeah, I, th- I think the the biggest challenge was the fact that um, really until Todd and and I guess to a certain extent Michael came along, uh, they weren't as distinct. Mm as individuals, Mm -hmm. as let's say the system lords, which is what I loved about the system lords, is they were all very colorful, they're very unique. They deliberately Um, went to set each other apart. Yeah, they were kind of a hive and it's just kind of tough to give a villain personality and you love to give your villains personality. Right. Um, So that I think was the biggest challenge for when it came to writing the Wraith, at least in the early going. Okay, that's fair. Steffer's tune, although the Wraith are this horrifying enemy the palette for the city of atlantis was lighter than mm-hmm. a base buried in cheyenne mountain was that a conscious choice to set a different tone for the show compared to yeah. sg1 from the beginning yeah absolutely no moss i, I mean <laughs> yeah it, no it, it absolutely was uh, a conscious decision to give it a uh obviously more kind of aquatic feel right. the, kind of the, the the blues uh are are all over that place and, and that's something, I, you know, I know Brad and, and Robert can specifically speak to because when they were designing that set, they were very involved. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm sure sort of 
again, that uh, aquatic theme ran throughout uh, those, the, kind of the early going, the early con con conception of, uh, of uh, the Atlantis, the theory of Atlantis. Three more, two, two relating to Atlantis and one, one to you specifically. Carlos Takeshi, season one introduced many things that would become critical recurring elements, the Hoffman drug, the Jedi, Taylor's connection with the Wraith. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything you wanted to, to include in those early episodes, the early going, or did include that didn't end up working like you had hoped? Or were any of those recurring, recurring elements from season one bigger deals than had originally intended? Um, I look back and no, there were no stories that I remember pitching that, that, uh, that were turned down. I mean, very much in that first season, the show was finding its, its, its footing. So, mm. um, you know, I, I, I look back and I, I think kind of as the series progresses, especially in the, in the late goings of that, that first season, I think it really comes into its own. Um, I think, I think the, it, the first, I think, uh, two or three episodes are like really strong. And then the middle of that first season, I think is probably the roughest go of, of, of the series as okay. a whole. With like- In um, my opinion. Okay, with the, the hurricane and everything else. Well, actually, no, actually, sorry. I, I think that mid-season two-parter stands out amongst, okay. uh, so it basically starts strong, you know, continues along. Then we get really strong with that mid-season two-parter. And then, then there's a I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I look, I look at, you know, you mentioned, you know, there are certain stories that, you know, uh, work and, 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 and some that don't and, and, you know, hits and misses and, and there were misses in, in, in that first season. You can only, Com you can only produce so many rabbits from hats, you know, right. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you have to go with something else, you know, yeah. not to say that you're giving up, but you know, you, you have to. I can't imagine the pressure that you guys were under every year, you know? You have to see what sticks. Yeah. Me, anytime. Uh, the last Stargate-related question, and this is one that I also assumed was going to be the case considering the Zat gun adoption in SG-1. Mm -hmm. In SG-1, they adopted the Zats. In Atlantis, the Wraith stunners, when they become guns, when they become pistols mm -hmm. by the beginning mm -hmm. of Season 2, um, they weren't adopted. Thoughts on why this was? I was kind of always expecting that. Um, I guess from a sort of practical standpoint, I don't know if like the, the, the Wraith, the, the stunners, I sh did they work on the Wraith? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Or to those some effect? Well, mm -hmm. then we should have. I guess we should have. Yeah. The, I mean, the one thing that I can think of is that Zat guns can kill and the stunners can't. So mm -hmm. they only have, uh, this seems to be the word of this episode. They only have so much utility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe that's, right. maybe that's the thing. But I, I had always been under the assumption that, yeah, well, you know, we, we acquire the alien tech like the mandate was for, for Stargate Command. Um, mm. I think that that would... The Asuran stunners, and I've got one right over here, uh, those were badass. Right. So I'd love to have seen that. Thank you for watching this clip from Dial the Gate. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving us a thumbs up with that like button. It will encourage the algorithm to show this to other Stargate fans. Also, please consider sending this to a fellow Stargate friend. I also want to invite you to subscribe to future episodes right here on YouTube. We are a live show, so changes are likely to happen all the time. And if you plan on joining us live, you'll want to be the first to know. Be sure to visit dialthegate.com for the complete guest schedule so you'll know when to join us and ask your very own questions to our guests. See you on the the other side.